Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Dr. Rosie Perez. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor and I'm actually now the division head of higher education in the School of Education at Iowa State University. Um, before we can get into today's agenda, I really want to thank Daryl P. and in particular the Foundational Course Initiative for bringing me back to Ann Arbor. It's been a while um, since I've been on campus, and it's always a joy to kind of be back in Ann Arbor, particularly in the fall um, before it starts snowing. <laughs> so, uh, to, I mean, it's true. Uh, today, I want to share some insights from my teaching and research, so things that kind of bring together multiple perspectives across my work as an educator, and I use that word really intentionally, as an educator, how I engage students with their learning across contexts, um, to really think about how do we understand what knowledge is, who gets to know and create knowledge, and then how do we assess that? Um, to me, those things increasingly, uh, as I've been in my faculty role longer and longer, to me, really highlight um, how we can use our classroom spaces and actually our broad educational spaces to both enhance and inhibit um, the experiences of students from minoritized and underserved backgrounds. So I, bring together lots of my experiences. So during um, our time together today, what I'll do is kind of situate, again, I'm a social scientist, how do I come to this work? And what does that mean for how I'll engage with you today? We'll do some exploration of paradigms, so various perspectives on knowledge and how they relate to both our teaching and our research. Um, and we'll think about how that relates also to identity. I'll share with you some considerations uh, for advancing inclusive teaching kind of rooted in really research, educational research um, to really think about how do we bring that to bear in various disciplines that uh, then hopefully we'll, we'll have application throughout right to get you to think about at least as a starting point again we have two hours so what is a good starting point for raising some new questions about how you engage in teaching and learning in your particular discipline or field of study. So Matt was very kind to do a very nice introduction of my CV, which always sounds so lovely when people highlight all these nice things about you. Um, but I think there's a, a really, some other very important things to know about me as an educator, because they really do shape, again, how I'm coming to this conversation. So. I'm here as a second generation Filipina American. Um, I was raised and educated in predominantly white environments on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio in the suburbs. Um, I'm here as a heterosexual cisgender woman who went to Catholic schools for K-12 and was really taught the importance of being a good Catholic, um, being a good student, which often meant um, sitting still, performing, memorizing things. Um, those were the ways to demonstrate my learning. Um, I'm somebody who came to post-secondary education in the biological sciences and psychology. So my, my training is actually in the sciences at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, but I had a really fantastic experience both as a biologist, but then actually outside of the classroom, which launched my trajectory into higher education student affairs. So I earned my master's degree in higher education and student affairs at the University of Vermont. And then I did my PhD here in the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. So I graduated in 2014. Um, I'm also here as a wife and a mom. Um, I'm an educator who lives somewhere where I'm raising a multiracial family where monoraciality is the norm. Um, so really having to think differently about what it means to navigate space for us as a family and what that means for how my daughter thinks about her educational spaces has been something where neither my husband nor I can relate to some of the things she talks about and experiences in schools and schooling. And then I'm here as a former student affairs educator, and Kurt, this is one of our cohorts that graduated, um, where I taught their capstone. So this, I'm a student affairs educator at my core, um, and a faculty member whose scholarship, teaching, and service really is centered on how do we create more equitable and inclusive environments that foster learning and allow students to be whole people. Most things should not be in opposition or in competition, but often they are placed as separate. Co-curricular, curricular, 
you know, this is where you talk about identity. It doesn't belong in this space. I do not subscribe to that. Um, and so I present this as a way of saying this is how I'm entering our conversation today. Um, so how I come to this work has really shaped how I think about teaching and learning as a potential site, as always. Um, it is both a site of social reproduction um, and knowledge reproduction. It is also potentially a space for us to engage in some liberatory work to really change how we think about the teaching and learning process. Um, so Matt provided an overview of my scholarship. In the broadest sense, I study student learning and development in college. So my work falls in three areas. I study meaning making, so how do students interpret their experience, and often with increasing complexity over time, there's a particular theory called self-authorship. Dr. Pat King in the School of Education is well versed in this. So if you have questions about self-authorship, I'll encourage you to contact Pat. I study intercultural learning and development, so a lot of that is rooted in my work as a student affairs educator and my lived experiences as somebody who spent most of my time in my career um, really working in spaces that were not the dominant, we're not, we're in a dominant culture, um, where I have not been in a space where my, there's other people who are Asian American or working from collectivist orientations. So I've tended to be in spaces that are, are not reflective of my identities. I also taught in IGR here, so I also work from like a dialogic standpoint and really trying to understand how do we get people to talk across differences, understand, and stay engaged when things are very difficult. Um, and often with the goal of transformation, so making things more equitable. So not just talking. Talking and then what is really a lot of, we're really good at talking in the academy. My question is always the so then what. Um, I also study graduate education. So increasingly my work has been focused on the socialization of graduate students. So early in my career, and I still do this work related to student affairs educators and practitioners. So what do they learn about their particular field of study through graduate education, both in class and out of class? And then how does that translate to how they understand what the field is, is not, their inclinations to want to stay, and I'm actually still with some folks who've studied, started that work with me. Um, I'm also doing some work now across the disciplines to understand how graduate students learn about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Perhaps not surprisingly, many of them don't. Um, and where are, they, where are they going to learn if they aren't getting it in their home department? What are the other strategies that they have? So we're learning about that. But also, what are some opportunities, frankly, that are missed in departments um, that, that could be capitalized on? And honestly, I think one of the hardest things to hear is sometimes some disciplines and fields where you would think we would want to talk about equity and inclusion. Students have horrifying experiences within them. So sometimes how we're very able to talk about what everyone else should be doing and are unlikely to examine the work that is happening in our home units in relation to equity. It's easier for me as a scholar to say, I'm going to analyze this. It's much more challenging to say, let me consider how I might be reproducing um, hostility you know, related to race, class, gender, sexual orientation in my own teaching and advising. That's much harder. So what I'm doing today will kind of bring us to the center of that, and in particular, my increasing work with STEM faculty as part of an NSF project uh, that's partnered with CERTL that really has highlighted to me um, how we think about knowledge and the disciplines and the gaps between how we think about knowledge and how that relates to identity. So in particular, my repeated conversation with faculty has been, is it important to consider students' identities when they come to the lab or they come to your program? The answer is always yes. Like it does matter that more women are coming to STEM. It matters that students of color are coming to my particular discipline where they're underrepresented. My follow-up question is always, so then how does that inform your teaching and advising practices? And almost without a fail, the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't matter to being a good scientist. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I've come to realize that disconnect, particularly for students who say, I can't disconnect being a woman scientist, or a black woman scientist, or an indigenous person in computation. Like, I can't, those things don't live separate for me. 
is really challenging. Okay, so how the faculty sometimes are talking to students about what matters and how it plays into the work that they're doing is very different how students are thinking about themselves and the disconnect. So I come to the space with that perspective in mind. So we're going to start with a little bit on thinking about various paradigms and constructions of knowledge. Um, what I'd like you to do, we have paper on the table, they know you're eating, but if you would take a few minutes to jot down some initial thoughts to these questions. So in your discipline or field, what makes knowledge valid? And how does someone know or prove something? Okay. Just a few minutes to jot down some thoughts about how do you know something? How do you prove it? I'm going to ask you to start to write down Finish whatever sentence or thought you are writing down. I know you could probably write careful books on this topic. <laughs> I'm going to ask a few folks if they'd be willing to share their insights. It would be helpful if you would share with us um, your particular discipline or field, since I know this is a multidisciplinary group. So from what space are you entering this conversation, and then share some insights with us about what makes what makes knowledge valid in your particular area, and then how do you know or prove something? I can have a couple of volunteers. Of course. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Kate Burrell, I've been at the University of Michigan for 40 years. Um, I've had joint appointments in the medical school and the College of Engineering. I'm a neuroscientist and, uh, and we've been working in the laboratory and in the classroom at, um, on a number of interesting science problems where I've involved 362 undergraduates over the four, 40 years that I've been in Michigan as research students. I've also run the at the ethics programs in the sciences and STEM disciplines here for 23 years. Um, perhaps many of you and or your students have taken books 503. And um, at the beginning of that course, every year, I always make every student, and I do this in my NSF GRF workshop as well, raise their hands and, and swear they'll never seek to prove a hypothesis but instead to test <coughs> a hypothesis. Because there are certain issues of preconception about knowledge, about hypotheses, about what is valid, about what is true. And <coughs> since, since science only is as good as it is true and as <coughs> flexible as a discipline can be given many minds on it, and that's where diversity comes in. Because all scientific disciplines that I've been associated with over the years, uh, particularly through the NIH prep program that I've directed for the last 12 years, which is for underrepresented students who want PhDs or MD PhDs in the biosciences, engineering, chemistry, mathematics, etc is to leave room open for exploration. And the set in stone curriculum, which prevails in some international students' countries, particularly Asian countries, where, where there are, where a fact is a fact, and you memorize vast amounts of data and disgorge them, um, have led some People in those countries, for example, my counterpart at Beijing University um, has reported um, ethical violations in science publishing, as well as cheating on the GRE and all sorts of other things that, that have come to fore because people needed to adhere to a curricular fact or proof. So in mathematics, I think they are provable. Thank you. So the idea that 
knowledge is valid once we test it, and that we should be open to the idea of science being a process of discovery, but we shouldn't mm -hmm. come up in with a assumption, is what I'm also thinking about here. Yeah, okay. Can I have one or two other people share? Um, I'm a first year student in the School of Social Work um, and I have found the funny thing about the first the first question is that <laughs> we talk a lot about the history of social work um, it comes from a very you know Eurocentric Western white woman prescriptive um, lens and it's still it still is to me very much so my family's from Tanzania so I'm always like what's the international global what are the implications right? So in the time that I've been here, I've learned about evidence-based practices, ecological frameworks. Um, I wrote down that the client has the solution um, and that the, the answers are really with them, which I do love. Um, it's about their lived experiences. We really don't know what we don't know, but we as the social workers or the therapists, um, we can only document and, and kind of just note that down today in class. The class I just came from, they were like, don't write your case notes as though you're going to be subpoenaed. <laughs> <Which I don't laughs> right, so like be vague, um, but also document everything. So I, there's really an interplay of, of that, um, and I'm, I'm resting with it. <laughs> Thank you. Can have one other person to be willing to share? Hi, my name is Kelly, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Art and Design. And I guess what I have to say has parallels to what both of the people who previously spoke said, which is that um, in design, and I'm an interaction designer, so in my area in particular, knowledge is validated through a process of trial and error in which the designer comes to better understand how their design communicates or works. Um, but this often, or usually, should ideally involve formal or informal um, collaboration with other people who, like you were just saying, actually have the answer. So you don't really know how it's going to work until you see people other than yourself interact with it. So um, one of my friends has this expression he uses a lot in his classes and practice, which is that the user is not me. And I think that's you know something really important, something I try to impart to my students. So um, yeah, this idea that when you actually put you know, a physical product or um, a communication design or test out an idea for a service or experience with people, that's where you're actually gonna produce knowledge, essentially, from their, their responses and reactions to it. Thank you. So we've had three examples from three different disciplines and fields and three somewhat related but still different perspectives on what makes knowledge valid and then how do you know, um, which again, kind of highlights if you think about how students are coming into foundational courses, they come in with some assumptions around what is valid, how does one know something, how does one prove something. We as course instructors, from our disciplinary perspective, have some assumptions about that as well, um, but rarely are those kind of surfaced, kind of students kind of learn that, often in the process of assignments. Um, it's not often made very explicit, so this kind of grappling with well, how do you know if I tell a student, well, you need a citation? So sometimes students will say, so is it not valid if it's not published? In particular for graduate students, I mean, that becomes like a really, that's a really compelling question. Is it, how much do you need to have it cited by somebody else for it to be valid? And when do you, when do you need to assert your own original thought? Like what's the tenuous balance of that for scholars? Particularly, I would say sometimes in the social sciences where you might be, encouraged to like, assert your opinion, what's an opinion and what needs to be supported. So again, these are, these are some tensions. I am going to very quickly, um, and I will send PDFs of my slides um, to FCI, so for folks who want to be able to come back, pull citations, you will be able to use the library and Google Scholar <laughs> to find full articles. So paradigms are interpretive frames that guide actions, and in particular, Paradigms shape how we think about the nature of reality, so our ontology, how we view knowledge, so our epistemology, and then in turn how we gather information, so our methodology. So paradigms often align 
right? We have a particular viewpoint about the nature of reality and knowledge, and that shapes then, well, how do we discover, test, build new knowledge? Those things come in alignment with each other. There's lots of different paradigms. Some disciplines and fields really work from a paradigm, maybe two, like a little riff on positivism and post-positivism. Um, but in a field like education, for example, which is an interdisciplinary field of study, I think we go back and forth, we want to be a discipline, but we draw from everyone else. Um, as an interdisciplinary field of study, pretty much all of these things show up in educational research. Right? So even educators talking to each other across various assumptions about knowledge can really have significant implications for how we think about what should be taught in ed schools or how we think about what makes good research. Okay, so again, I'll do these very quickly. As I review them, if things resonate with what you wrote about what makes knowledge valid, I'd encourage you to jot that down, okay, to think about that. So positivism um, typically is associated with the scientific method, right? So objective uh, reality is objective, the truth is noble, and I use capital T truth very intentionally. That there is a singular unifying truth, we measure it and test it through observation, it is value neutral. Science is science. I don't care how you feel about science. I mean, I might care as a person how you feel about science, but to the actual work of science, for example, your feelings about it or views of it are irrelevant. Um, the goal is to predict and compare, and then again, this idea that we, we're going to test and verify often scientific law. So that's positivism. Related is a post-positivist stance. So still uses a capital T truth, but the, that truth is a little fuzzier um, in that it's imperfect. Um, Post-positivists often account for bias. So if you're thinking about what makes for good research, you're going to at least acknowledge the potential for bias in how the study is designed, the data are collected, and perhaps interpreted. It still remains a pretty value-neutral stance. And again, we're going to predict and compare. And we're going to use structured processes, similar to the scientific, scientific method, really, still, to kind of predict, compare, and see what might be some new findings we didn't expect. We might be more open to the idea of disproving from a post-positivist sense. So I come to the space kind of from many of these paradigms after. So my previous training was really in positivist, most po more post-positivist stance as a biologist, and then really having moved into the social sciences kind of uh, really shifted my thinking. So constructivism and constructionism, these are related concepts. So from these stances, when I think about what is the nature of knowledge and truth, that's really individual. So it'd be a little t, truth. It keeps auto-correcting word, <laughs> right? Word is very angry at me trying to say that truth can't be with a capital T, particularly at the beginning of the sentence. But um, reality is constructed. So how, what is the nature of reality is we figure that out. Like, you know, if you've ever had a conversation with somebody where something happens in a, in a class, and afterwards you say, what, what happened in there? What do you think that happened in there? And you're trying to gather as much information as you can to figure out the what, like what transpired in a classroom. In a constructivist or constructionist standpoint, participants or individuals' perspectives are at the center of that. So knowledge is co-created. So for example, I, as a qualitative researcher, try to understand individuals' realities, and we co-construct, like the meaning emerges in the context of, let's say, an interview or a focus group. Um, new knowledge is built and created. People create new insights and understandings of a particular phenomenon or experience as they talk it out that they might not have had until they've been prompted to verbalize. So claims are usually made by individuals or groups. Um, I would say the nuanced difference between constructivism and constructionism is that constructionism attends more to social groups and social cultural contexts. So meaning is made, but constructionism really attends to the idea that people are situated within cultures. Another paradigm is a critical stance. So 
the idea that <coughs> systems of oppression exist. Okay, so a critical stance works with the assumption that systems of oppression exist and those shape and constrain how we understand the nature of knowledge and truth. In fact, that those are used to uphold and maintain systems. So from those perspectives, you know, what is truth has been constructed to sustain a dominant narrative. So in the context, if I think about, it upholds white supremacy, it upholds heterosexism, it upholds the dominance of um, like those from an upper class perspective. Like th that's, uh, from a critical perspective, we would assume that, the, that oppression is real and I'm not trying to prove that it's a thing through my work. The goal of a critical stance is to be liberatory and emancipatory, and so that really does shape research methods. Often those are more participatory um, and working with people as opposed to gathering things and then coming back and saying, this is what you should do. Um, it's discursive and it requires action. So often researchers who take a critical stance are not just here to understand something and then go publish something, which they might do. But truly critical scholars will then return to the communities and individuals with, with, which, with whom they work with and think about what are actionable ways to make your experience more equitable. Like how, are, how can we do this more liberatory? So claims in, from a critical stance are often meant to surface or name things that are left unnamed. So it is not unusual if, for a critical race perspective, for example, some of the tenets of CRT is that racism is enduring and embedded in social structures. Like that is one of the central tenets of critical race theory. So again, a very different stance um, that makes explicit power, um, which some of the other frameworks have not to date. Um, here's a space where I think I live now, which is critical constructivism. Um, so I still believe knowledge is socially constructed, but that happens within systems of oppression that shape and constrain how knowledge is generated, created, what is seen as valid. Uh, it attends to dominant cultures and names that. Uh, education in particular, critical constructivism has not been used as widely in other disciplines and fields. In education, I think increasingly folks are moving to the stance that they don't want to give up the notion of development, but they're very critical. Um, sometimes those views are seen as incompatible. I think they can work together. Um, and again, the goal is to liberate. We also have a postmodern or post-structural approach. So the truth is personally relative. Um, it's co-created. Again, it, it links to power, um, but it, I think really post-structural frameworks will really attend to community in a, in a different way. Um, I don't have particular expertise. So if, if you know folks on this campus who might be post-colonial scholars, um, post-colonial scholars often will take a post-structural approach to really thinking about what are the indigenous knowledges that are deeply embedded within communities that then we actually often ignore that would be beneficial for the good of the whole. Not just the individual, but for shaping what is known in community. So these are some um, ways we might think about knowledge. And I'm gonna bring us back to our initial question about what makes things valid. So I'd like you to take a few minutes to talk to somebody at your table and consider the following, okay? What paradigm or paradigms, based on what you wrote about knowledge, do you think are most reflected in your discipline or sub-discipline? Um, so sometimes I know, again, as a multi, disciplinary scholar in my most close field of play what what ideas are people mostly using how do you think then this paradigm and construction of knowledge influences what is taught and how it's taught and then if you get to this where does identity fit into any of that I know this is a lot but engage in some conversation with at least one or two people at your table and think through what paradigms are reflected in your discipline, how does it relate to your T 
teaching practices and content, and then where does identity fit into that? I'll give some folks a few minutes. <coughs> I'm going to ask folks to please leave my, I hate to kill the conversation, but actually I'm hoping that we might share, um, kind of going off script from my initial PowerPoint a little bit, but I'm hoping that we might share some insights in relation to how do you think, if folks wouldn't mind sharing a few volunteers maybe we haven't heard from, how do you think the paradigm that you come to your discipline with influences what is taught and how it's taught? And what does that relate or have anything to do with identity? So I think these are really, I heard a lot of like, from here I could hear some really interesting thoughts about, I've never thought about how this might shape how we teach and who we teach to and how they receive. Um, I will, my name is Martha, I work with first year students. So. I would just say that we use um, a constructivist method and one of the places where it shows up in what we do is something we call collective reflection at the end of each small session. There's only like 10 to 15 students in there. So we pose a question. It might be what's the takeaway today or where did you see a particular kind of dynamic that we were working on that day? Where did you see it in class today? And we do that so that they reflect back and cement what they learn but also so that they hear that other people might have gotten something else out of it. And together, instead of each person taking away only one thing, maybe then they were able to take away two or three. What's the discipline or field that the course is in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Making the Most of Michigan. So it's um, out of IGR, but it's Applied Liberal Arts class. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Alexa Pearson from the library, and we were talking a little bit about there are kind of two layers of knowledge construction in libraries. So there's one layer that is um, related to how we develop services and how we know about how libraries should operate and what's our practice. And then there's the other layer, which is what we do daily, which is working with students and classes and teaching about how to do research and how to evaluate sources. And at that level, I think that we're on a spectrum of post-positivism to constructivism to critical constructivism. And we've been tending more toward the critical constructivism. <laughs> but on the level of like, what should our practices be and how should we develop services, it's hard to get past positivism where we're very focused on what's our evidence, what does our data tell us, and we, we just always have this tension between like, is something just a story or anecdotal or do we have data, do we have evidence? And so it's, that's a really interesting tension just in the field. Um, and I don't know where identity is. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't, I don't know if we have a strong sense of how present that is in any of the work. So. Thank you. So just this talk was very illuminating for me. Um, so I'm in the Comprehensive Studies program and I teach math. Um, and so my background is in math, but then I did my PhD in education. So I've gotten the whole um, range of <laughs> different paradigms. But taking the math perspective, I mean, it's interesting. The first thing I wrote down for like how is knowledge constructed, and in math it's essentially validated by peers. Or you could think of it as being scrutinized by peers. Um, so it's some sort of consensus. Um, and in math, it's definitely positivism, and I'm not even sure that you could even try to bring in any of the others into it, as a field itself. Um, I'd be interested to some arguments why you might be able to. But um, So how does it influence what's taught and how it's taught? So there exists a set of things that need to be taught and learned in a particular way, in a particular order. Um, and there's some people who deviate that from that, but it's overall kind of like a larger consensus um, with little you know modifications in it. Um, but how does it influence how identity is discussed? And for the most part, it's not discussed except for in like groups of people who are particularly interested in it, but in the field as a whole, it's not. Um, 
which then I guess it kind of makes sense to me now why that's the case. Before it was just always like, well, that's how those people are, or whatever. But there's, I, I, can, <laughs> I can kind of see the, the uh, you know, people are attracted to certain fields for certain reasons, and that's going to, you know, kind of align with everything. So I found that very interesting. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? I teach climate science, and we have to deal with validity quite a bit in that, in that discipline. Um, and I don't know anything about these paradigms, and I can't, I think maybe negativism is, <laughs> <laughs> is a new one for me. Uh, and the reason I came to this session was that I'm trying something in my class, this is a class of about 300 students, um, you know, how do I, I don't know the identity of students, yet I want to bring those students who are underrepresented in the sciences to feel like they belong, that they can participate in this and, at a high level. And the simple uh, trick I've tried is to install a, a, an anonymous back channel in class, so everyone can ask a question. A core teaching assistant answers them during class, like what Perry meant to say was, and they, they can see the questions and answers without seeing who asked the question. And that's fundamentally changed my class so that, like, in other years I'd go, any questions? And you might get 12 questions over the course of the semester. I get over 500 questions now, which is very sobering about how confusing I've been all these years. <laughs> I didn't know it. But the point is, I also ask questions, of a survey on day one of how comfortable are you in this course? And how comfortable would you be asking questions in this course? And there are cohorts of students who are the first generation students, the females, and, and students from English is not their native language who are less comfortable asking questions. And yet when you offer this sort of back channel, um, they are participating at or higher than the rest of the population. So it, we're not gonna get rid of these large classes. The question is how do we allow identity, um, how do we allow you to feel, regardless of your identity, that you, you can participate? Your questions are no dumber than anybody else's questions. And does that keep you then in the discipline? So a couple interesting thoughts in relation. So for folks who maybe aren't in a position to create a back channel, even a small language twist, instead of saying, do you have any questions? I just assume you have questions. So I say, what questions do you have? And inherently, they're like, oh, you expect, you expect us to ask questions. Um, and that has changed a lot of things for me. Um, for those of you who might be teaching smaller seminars, I've also found that I use, um, in addition to large classes, your Canvas campus now I've heard, they have a really cool tool. It's very easy to use. Essentially, it's a Google Doc in the collaboration section. And I just all the time will open a, a class collaboration so that for every class session, you know, I might start the class with saying, what questions do you have about the readings or an activity or whatever we did that you want us to explore further today? So that it requires me as an instructor to be a little more flexible with my planning. And I tend to teach large like seminar for three hours, so I'm allowed to be a bit more flexible. But students can see in real time that people are posing questions. If you are the kind of class where you might have people do groups and want to do reporting or see if people got the same results if they ran an experiment. Like you can dump them into that space so people can see them in real time. Um, and so there's some just real small things in addition to this really wonderful example that was shared um, about how you might get folks to contribute to the learning. Um, one of the other things that strikes me is that in relation to identity, to be honest, most students who are women, people of color, first gen or the intersection of those things have been told they're not supposed to ask questions. In fact, they've been actively discouraged, you know, in prior educational environments or school and schooling, or if you ask a question, sometimes it's been seen as oppositional or it's framed as you aren't seen as smart or that fear of not being as smart. And so, you know, thinking about what does that mean for folks with their prior schooling experiences? Um, can be really powerful. Sometimes we just don't know. And you might be the first person who's created an opportunity to ask a question in a safe way without being perceived as dumb, less capable, 
So these are some tensions that exist around identity. It's with us whether or not we name it, and it shows up in different ways around who engages and, and who doesn't. So I was going to have us also consider, originally this was going to be you just writing, but I, I want you to maybe uh, return to your partner. So now that you've got these insights about the discipline and where does identity fit in, to give some thought to the ways in which, who do you think is going to succeed in your courses? Right, given the modes of inquiry, the way that you think about how we teach, like, and it doesn't necessarily have to be related to identity, but given the paradigm, how you think about knowledge, who's going to succeed? So the example I'll give is I teach ed in education and I teach a lot of ed theory courses. And what is extremely hard for students is the idea when they're applying theory to actual people as we're trying to understand human development, that it's not one way. So students who are extremely concrete thinkers or came from a positivist background struggle with the idea that there's not one right developmental pathway. That there isn't a best practice. And I said there's some really good ones, but they don't always work when you put them in context, for example. So when I think about how I construct some of my assignments, who's going to struggle if their thinking is not that flexible quite yet? Um, who, I, similarly, like who's going to find the content and your approach to, to instruction difficult? And then whose identities and experiences are centered? If you say identity is not in my course, I will challenge you as a critical scholar to say it's there. It may be unnamed. Um, so to think about what are the dominant cultures that have constructed what is valid knowledge. Um, and for those of you who might come from a really great sociology book is White, white Logic, White Methods, for example, in sociology to think about how race and whiteness has constructed how we think about method, quantitative method, for example. Um, so I'll give some folks time to return to their partner to, to think through these questions, and then we'll move into what I really know you're thinking about is what do we do? So I'll give some thoughts on that after we have some time to talk to return to your partner. Right. Yeah. I can bring this back together. So I'm curious, you know, after, now that you've thought a bit about how your paradigm might influence the teaching and learning process and how it relates or perhaps doesn't to identity, you've thought a bit about who might succeed, who do you think is best supported in your particular courses, your discipline and field, given how we think about what matters in terms of knowledge? When you think about your own courses, who do you think is best supported in those learning spaces? Hi, my name is Dominic. I'm a PhD candidate in the German department. So from a humanities perspective, since we're pretty much, don't, I mean, positivism doesn't exist in the humanities, <laughs> more or less, and at least in my department, I'm much a critical paradigm. I mean, Germans invented critical theory, so. Um, and so students in my courses who are most likely to succeed are ones who are willing to always second guess other people's opinions. So the way progress and inquiry works in the humanities is always arguing with other people. Everything's up for interpretation, and so if you can theoretically nuance or challenge someone else's opinion, then yours is as valid, if not more, than the other person. And so if you're trained or come from an educational background where you're given an answer and you're supposed to accept it as the valid answer, where you don't ask questions, where you don't have, you're not trained to have a creative mind, then you often are perceived as less intelligent or less apt in the, in, in the field. Um, especially in a foreign language context, is all, especially in German, class and race, are major um, predictions, predictors for who succeeds because if you come from a really white institution as a high school student, you have more access to German. Um, if your parents aren't wealthy enough to send you abroad, then you often have less of a, a, a faculty for the language and uh, then as you progress through the major, you would suffer in comparison to everyone else. I'm with the Comprehensive Studies program and I teach biology. Um, kind of want to parallel up with what was just said. Um, who finds the most difficulty in approach? Students that had no access to AP biology courses, for sure. Uh, transfer students who just didn't have the same opportunity as coming to a you know, large university where the rigor is, is much, much 
different. Um, we also discussed the fact that most scientific discoveries were by white males. And so as females teaching, of course, one thing we might want to try to do is incorporate the awesomeness of, of female you know, minorities, whatever, um, from that perspective. You know. Yeah, I just think one big thing we struggle with is, oh my, where's the shape? Um, if you come from a high school where you were never learned to teach or to learn conceptually, and you just wrote in memorize, life, that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. That was all of you talking. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have one more person who'd be willing to share? Um, I'm a PhD student in linguistics. Um, and linguistics is kind of a, a weird hodgepodge of fields. Um, and we, there are a lot of different approaches to what knowledge is, how we find knowledge, and kind of mixtures of knowing that our data points, the people that we're studying, have uh, kind of construct knowledge in maybe a constructionist way that we might look at from a positivist method. Um, and so in teaching some of, you know, all of this stuff, um, uh, as an instructor, you have to kind of uh, uh, flip from what angle you're approaching each study. So in, in a class that I've taught, um, it's language and discrimination. Um, so we, we might look at studies that are acoustic studies that are very positivist, kind of STEM-oriented in methods, and then also look at critical race theory. Um, and so being able to explicitly say to students, um, we're looking at this study, here's the goal of the study, here are the assumptions of the person who did the study, and here's you know, what what proof, well, we don't use the word proof, but like, here's what proof means for this versus here's what proof means for that. And so students who um, succeed a, a, in classes like this are ones who have the flexibility and kind of willingness to challenge their views of what knowledge is and what knowledge can be. Um, and then kind of simultaneously, uh, linguistics is hard to teach because um, all of us use language, um, and everyone assumes that they're uh, an expert about capital L linguistics rather than lowercase l language. Um, and so that, that creates this other type of difficulty in asking students to challenge some of their you know, worldviews around cap big L linguistics. Thank you. So as, a, as I was listening to people talk and then our volunteers who were kind enough to share, you know, these, this kind of idea is of how many people were taught before they came to Michigan that you were allowed to ask questions, that maybe truth was uncertain, that multiple perspectives were valid. And in particular disciplines and fields, the idea that there is, there are multiple views is quite important. And in others, that's actually not particularly relevant. We have differing evidence, but your feelings about that evidence don't really matter to me. Um, and so, you know, that is, but the question is how much do we actually engage students with that very concept? It's often, again, left really, it's left tacit, right? So people are coming in with different views of what makes for good knowledge. Uh, maybe even in your departments, you know, amongst colleagues, we have different views about what makes for good knowledge, good science. How does that happen? Where does identity fit in? But because we never talk about it, it remains invisible. Um, in some ways, it can maintain systems where folks are excluded if they're not seen as valid knowers or not potentially contributors of knowers. I mean, sometimes when someone says, like, we need evidence, and then my question will be, yes. And who decided what made for good evidence? And they're like, you know, I don't. I have a citation, it's in parenthetical notation in APA. <laughs> good start, also then what made it good? Who decided? And these kinds of bigger questions, you know, we're often, you know, myself included, we're not taught that that was an important question to ask. How did we decide? 
as a you know a disciplinary community, this is the convention. And like when you hear statisticians talk about, you know, is p less than 0 0.05? Why is that the thing? And everyone's like, well, that's just like like the convention. Well, who decided? I don't know. Some People can never quite, there's usually uh, somebody who has a background in stats and history will be able to tell me, right, how we maybe came to that convention. But then you have all these discussions. Well, it's not statistically significant, but it's, you know, point, one, point zero, point 0.1 might be practically significant in a particular problem space. So we're just going to ignore that this might help people if it didn't meet these thresholds. And so there's these real tensions around how we come up with conventions and who decides. Okay, so I'm going to move us towards um, engaging with some of these questions I hear from you. How then do I bring to bear these questions I have about including students and their identities in some spaces in which they aren't always seen as particularly relevant? So that's kind of where I'm taking us to thinking, again, I study development, so I'm interested in how people not only learn content or work on gain mastery or acquire content. I'm interested in actually their complex thinking or abilities to evaluate and make sense of that. Um, because sometimes you'll have students who will come to the same conclusion, but their pathways are really different. If you ask, why did you do that? They'll say, well, that's what we learned in class and that's what I memorized, so that's why I did it. And other students will say, well, we learned about it in class, and then I decided I wasn't confident that was the thing, so then I did a Google search, and I went down the rabbit hole, and found five other sources that I considered, and after weighing this evidence, I still decided this thing I learned in class was still the best way. Um, you can get multiple pathways to the same solution, um, but the complexity of the thinking might vary. I actually have a student that I was working with on a project who told me they were penalized um, they got the right solution on a math problem in one of their courses, and the instructor did not care that their pathway of thinking, they basically um, almost failed the, the test in the class because their reasoning differed from the instructors, and they were penalized for not taking the pathway they were told to memorize. Even though they came to the same solution, the student could explain the solution and why the mathematical thinking was good sound thinking rooted in the course concepts, it didn't match the best way the instructor thought, so they didn't care. So these are also realities of students where they might have more flexible thinking and sometimes that is penalized in various learning spaces. So I offer to us a couple of considerations for thinking about how you might advance inclusion and support students' development in terms of engaging with complicated ideas. Again, we could teach whole semester-long courses on each of these concepts. So again, I'll send um, my slides so at least you'll have citations and I can um, link folks in if they'd like more. So one is asset-based approaches to learning. Fundamentally, um, many folks from minoritized backgrounds, particularly students of color, queer students, women, people from lower socioeconomic status, and when they enter spaces that are built on, again, I'm a critical person, from dominant power structures, the, the language that's most valued in writing usually reflects white middle class modes of communication. Um, the ways in which who's coached, should you ask an instructor, for, should you ask someone for help? Some folks are encouraged, yeah, everyone will help you. Other folks are told don't do that, it's a sign of weakness. Um, so there are really ways that we might not view students from a deficit. So the idea of like, here are the things that they don't know when they come in, and I, as an expert in my field, am going to impart to you in class. Um, there's ways that we might fundamentally flip that and think about, here's what students bring to the learning space, and my role as an instructor is to then engage them with the concepts of the course and the ideas in a way that is relevant and builds upon the knowledge and skills they bring with them. That is a really, for many schools and school, you know, that's, that's a pretty big flip. Um, and by that, I mean, here's an example. There's a concept called funds of knowledge, which is an education um, 
Funds of knowledge refers to the knowledge, skills, and assets that have been historically and culturally developed within families and communities. So this is, um, it really helps families function and communities function. In particular, funds of knowledge has been used and studied within Latinx communities, particularly Mexican American communities. So how is the shared knowledge then helping people navigate schools and entering into space? So the funds of knowledge research often highlights the power of situating examples and leveraging what students know. So it is as simple as, as you think about an example, thinking about how it might relate to an issue in the home environment. Or translating, there are likely some concepts if you're thinking about critically evaluating or sometimes being told not to, what does that mean from your familial space? So negotiating for students who are told, um, the example I'll give is when I think about my Latina students, are often told they're certainly not supposed to ask questions. That they're not, they're not supposed to. Um, that obedience and dutif being dutiful um, is valued and it's seen as disrespectful. So how might you engage students with kind of why they are or are not asking questions? Um, how might you leverage home practices to think about, um, for those of you who are engaging in quantitative reasoning, I mean, how does your family think about math and reasoning? How was that taught in your home? Um, the funds of knowledge folks will often find like skilled concepts of mathematics. Um, they do this with children, are learned through like the process of cooking um, or creating family budgets. Like people learn really good quantitative reasoning skills in helping the family function. But those are not seen as being actual ways of knowing that you could then translate to understanding mathematical concepts um, once you're in formal schooling. So another piece would be cultural wealth. So for those of you who are from soci sociology students, everyone has forms of capital. Uh, cultural capital, so how much do you know the skills, habits, and traits that are valued in the culture? So kind of some of the examples are things when I think about how we talk about dominant forms, you know, um, somebody mentioned studying abroad as that being a big form of capital. Who has the opportunity to learn something that gives you cachet um, to be able to travel internationally to not visit family in their home nation um, for leisure or for study? Uh, who? Who, it's, you know that old adage, it's not what you know, it's who you know? And the ways in which social capital plays out on a college campus, how did you find out, I mean, how many people do you, have you heard, how did you find out about this job? Well, my family friend, or my parents have this friend, and people get internships and it keeps accruing. Well, Terry Yoso really focuses on the cultural wealth that is often ignored from under, represented in minoritized communities. And in particular, her work focuses on um, people of color and really thinking about what is the wealth that people bring. So traditional notions of capital are still valid, but certainly um, she really highlights, highlights the value of students' aspirations and the aspirations of a particular community that can come when people enter dominant spaces, the linguistic capital so for those who have the flexibility to speak multiple language and or code switch to understand the environments that they're in, the familial capital. So what is it in terms of your family network um, that has been valued? Again, social capital is similar again, who you know. The navigational capital, so some students are have to learn how to function in different spaces. Um, because the space wasn't built for them. So sometimes they build other forms of systems. When I think about how um, particular graduate students of color of mine, for example, will share, oh, if you want this to happen, here's like what's on the website. Here are the other ways that people will help you translate that website to actually get it done. Um, so their students do this all the time. Um, share strategies for navigation and then resistance capital. So what are ways in which people might push back against kind of dominant ways of being? 
There are ways to affirm that students come in with skills that don't reflect what is most important in your discipline. There are ways to acknowledge that people have all of these capacities that often go untapped in our teaching and learning environments. That will look different depending on the kind of work you do. So um, I would offer that one way to do that, to validate funds of knowledge or build on it, to validate capital, is to use validating teaching practices. So Laura Rendon did work on really what she called at that point like underserved students, and in particular focusing on students of color, first gen, and low income students. And what it what her work really highlighted is the power of institutional agents, and by that she meant faculty and staff, in inherently affirming, just assuming that students have the capacity to succeed, and conveying that to them regularly, not just when they succeeded. So the power of folks getting validation both about their academic capacity and their interpersonal successes means a lot, and not only when you're doing well. For students who are underrepresented in the environment, um, there's ways to think about how do you affirm when students are struggling that you still know they can do it. Um, and that you know that you care about them. And it's sad to say, but lots of students go through institutions, um, and it doesn't matter if they're large or small. Never having a faculty or staff person tell them that they're actually capable of succeeding in college, and that anyone is personally invested in their success. And I say that as a former college administrator um, and current faculty member. There are lots of students who will graduate but never feel as though anyone cared about them doing well here. And so for those who come in with other structural barriers, whether that be finances, obligations at home, whether that be kind of struggling with the course content, um, to know what does it mean when folks don't actually say, you can actually do this. Okay, so validation. Um, I know Michigan does attend in DEI to thinking about culturally relevant and cultural responsive teaching. So you'll see a lot of overlap in these concepts that I'm going to share with you. And that's because they're really good practices that we don't do enough of. <laughs> um, so they're related. So culturally relevant and cultural responsive teaching, I mean, really to me highlights if you think about syllabi examples and activities you might use in classes. I mean, who are people reading? Who wrote this stuff? Are there ways for you to incorporate a diversity of perspectives and authors? Sometimes they might disagree, and sometimes that's extremely helpful. Who wrote the textbook? Um, what examples of problems do you select? And how can you, if you are in a STEM field doing an application problem, can you situate a problem in a context that's culturally meaningful to students? Or is it always an abstraction? I think when students only have things in the abstract, it is, it is really difficult. How do you make course content relevant to people's lived realities? So culturally relevant doesn't just mean like, ah, today we did a reading on a person of color. It really means grappling with how, how might some of these real world problems, so if we're thinking about climate, well, what does environmental racism look like? Or if we think about who's going to have access to advocate for climate change, who can take the day off for the climate strike? Right. So some of our students come from home communities for, who are deeply affected by environmental racism. We're not that far from Flint, right? But lots of folks cannot take the day off without severe penalties to their well-being and their life chances if they say, I'm not coming to work. So these become some real things to engage students with and around. Provide as many opportunities as you can for shared construction of knowledge. And that can take lots of different forms. I mean, today we've done small group work, you can do projects. If there's opportunities for you, again, anything just can't happen. You have to think about the create creatively and scaling up. What does that look like then for students to share various solutions to problems, right? So you might have people try to write a proof 
And they still might take different pathways to the proof. I mean, I, again, my background as a scientist, I still remember one of my, my organic chemistry exams only had a, there was a chemical structure at the beginning and one at the end. There's two things just sitting on the paper. <coughs> and the instructor's response, the test was, I don't care, you can get to this in two steps, you might get to it in 20. Do what makes sense to you to get to that at the end. And I remember thinking, oh, oh, what do you mean? And so what would it mean then for that instructor as we're debriefing the exam, what would have happened because we didn't do this? I just looked at the paper and cried. Um, I did, I, I passed the class and did fine. Um, but I, what would have happened if we brought back the exams and laid out the many pathways students took and we thought together, well, why did you do it this way and not this way? So there's some missed opportunities to kind of engage in shared learning um, where there's multiple pathways in solving. And I, I would say that that ha can happen in STEM as easily as it can in social science where we're like, there's no right answer, but we still need to do something. I would also encourage you to attend to both the content of your courses and the process of your course. And so, because I have, I tend to teach things related to social identity, it's uh, related, it's always in all of my courses, or at least critical perspectives, um, really thinking to not just what are we gonna learn, but how are we going to learn it together? And that's really hard. I think sometimes in big courses we think, well, the course expectations are in the syllabus. I mean, they're mine too. But what would happen if you actually asked students at the beginning of semester, Qualtrics, you can do um, this back channel again. What, what would happen if you asked students, what do you most need in this class to succeed? Um, what if you asked them, you know, what are you most nervous or anxious about in the course? What if you ask them things like, what do you need from your peers to succeed? And actually shared that with them, anonymously or in an aggregate. I tend to do that in an aggregate. Like, here are some things students have submitted. Here's what people have said. Um, and it can be really powerful because people don't, they just thought you had to do whatever was, in, and they had no choice. But you as an instructor can think, what is reasonable? You know, sometimes I tell people, I can't do, like I'm not going to lecture for three hours on the readings. Like I've had students who say, I want you blow by blow to, to lecture. I'm like, I, nobody comes to a three hour seminar for a three hour lecture. I mean, I, I, I'd be so boring. Um, so I, I tell students within reason, but what I can do, I might say is, given the deep theoretical content, I will do a lecturette to help us situate some shared understanding so we can collectively engage. And they're like, oh, okay, you're going you're gonna to do that. And then they can also say to their peers, you know, here are some shared expectations. So again, it might look different based on the size of the class, but asking folks, like, how do we actually want to learn as a group? And the idea that it's a learning community, I actually just stopped using the word, I use the word class, but I really do talk about, even in bigger groups, within this learning community, where we're all gonna help each other learn, which again is a really powerful language shift for students, how do we want to engage? And I don't think most folks ever get asked what would help them learn or how they want to do that with other people. They just come in. So I'll ask you to do that. I will also ask you to consider the ways in which when you notice something as an instructor or it is brought to your attention that there are issues in your class related to students being excluded. There's a microaggression. There are people who feel that they have been hurt and harmed, either by you or as the instructor, um, a GSI, or another member of the class. I beg of you, please attend to that. And it is hard and uncomfortable, but it says a lot when we don't, when we don't attend to it. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. We vary in our degrees of comfort and skill. And I would say, you know, sometimes it's in the moment. I find I'm not like a direct, like, you said that and it was wrong. I tend to ask a lot of questions. So for, uh, here's a good example that I think will happen in your large classes. 
When we ask people to get into groups, I always notice how people sort, right? So an example is I was teaching a seminar on, um, we were grappling with white privilege and white supremacy in class. I didn't have that many students of color, so students were writing about the topic, reflecting on the reading, and I said, okay, I want you to get in groups and talk about what your responses were to the readings. Students get up, they sort, and I look in the room, and the two black women are sitting at this table by themselves going, well, that's interesting. They just looked at me. They didn't say anything. And I said, well, that's interesting. And I said, I got, I, don't worry. I said, I got you. So we came back, and before we started debriefing, like, what did you talk in your small group? I said, did anyone notice how we, how did you pick your partner, is really what I asked. How did you pick your groups? And everyone kind of looked around. And then someone, at, and I said, did you notice who got picked or didn't get picked? And finally, someone kind of had this realization that they were scared to talk across race around whiteness and left their black peers sitting. So our application of the material was not external. It was to what happened in the room, right? And it was a better class because I didn't just say, well, that was interesting, and kind of move into the direct, like, tell me what you got from the reading, which would have been much easier and more comfortable, I think, for everybody, um, but it helped the class. You know, I've talked to instructors who have noticed the same things when you do field work. So the students, like, who's going to go in the van? And, and the instructor was telling me, like, I noticed that all of the students who are part of, like, students who were mostly white all got in one van, and the students of color and the international students all got in the other van. And I said, well, did you talk about your noticings? And they said, no, but I, I'm wondering how this is going to affect my class. And I said, well, it's affecting your class whether or not you talk about it. So the question is, like, what, what are the possibilities if you just mentioned in class, hey, can we talk about this thing that I noticed? Because um, students, sometimes they do realize and sometimes they don't. But that really does have implications for identity and belonging and you know what happens if you're the student of color who tries to get in the wrong the van where you're getting the signal, I'm not supposed to get in this van, or you're inside of it going, I'm definitely in the wrong van. So there are things that we might notice but don't attend to that send really powerful messages when left unnamed. Um, so I, I just really ask people to attend to content and process. It's not always in the moment. Like sometimes it's you might think about something as the instructor and kind of feel a little stuck or like not sure what to do. I actually think it's more than appropriate to revisit things. And I think instructors sometimes when they're really focused on content mastery worry that if they don't get to the lecture or do whatever, we're not going, we won't learn what we need to learn. I'd argue that sometimes when we skip over it, they still might not get there because students in your class are thinking about the things left unsaid in class. So I offer that as like a um, opportunity if folks want to talk through strategies, more than happy to do that at another point. So the other piece is, again, uh, there's a, I study self-authorship, so it's a way of thinking about meaning making that it's a holistic approach to human development that attends to the cognitive domain, so how we think about knowledge, the interpersonal, how we think about our identity, and the interpersonal, so what kind of relationships do we want with others. Um, Marcia Baxter Magolda and Pat King, again, who's here at Michigan, developed this learning partnerships model that is intended to form, to um, support holistic development and students' capacities to um, view themselves as knowers. So the model has a couple of assumptions that, again, you'll see there are really constructivist. So knowledge is complex and socially constructed. Who you are, so the self is central to knowledge and the process of knowing, and that authority and expertise can and should be shared. So if those are some assumptions about fostering holistic learning and development, this translates into a few principles. And again, you'll see lots of these things overlap, right? Validating people's capacities to know. Um, asking them to bring what they know and affirming that. Again, situating learners, learning in the learner's experience. 
what are real examples you may use to create what can feel really abstract and make it meaningful. But that really matters. And then to really think about how can you share opportunities for learning. So again, it's not surprising to me that many of these things overlap. Um, and they overlap because we find ourselves as educators not doing them. So every, it's like they keep resurfacing in different but interrelated forms, and yet we really struggle to reimagine what might happen. So had I had more time, I think I would have, again, asked you to think about if you were to reimagine some courses, you know, and it might not even be big practices, right? Like it could be, how would you change the first day of class? How would you introduce the course differently to think about allowing people to see themselves as knowers, to validate that they can succeed, to think about how they want to engage with you and their peers. So it doesn't have to be that you're going to do a whole scale redesign. There can be some tweaks that you might engage in to really advance your work. Um, and we encourage you to give some thought to how, what does your engagement look like with students? Again, in a class of 300 or 1,000 if you're lecturing, that requires some creativity. But how do you create opportunities to actually, to the extent that you can, actually interact with students? It might not be all of them, but what are some touch points that you might create? Um, what does feedback look like? So in terms of validation, what I find is that many, many of us are taught to lead with what people did wrong or need to improve, rather than from the entry point of here are the strengths of what you submitted, and here are some of the errors, or maybe where you started to veer. You know, if you're trying to solve a problem, here's where it started, moving a particular direction, and then all of a sudden, here's where you got a bit off path, or where you struggled. And so, when people only hear, or you lead with, here's where it was wrong, they often kind of assume that means they can't do it or won't be able to, moving forward. So how do you validate that you gave some good effort and, it's both and, and there's room for substantive improvement and kind of strategizing about what might that look like. So I, I have found that um, feedback in particular and how students receive that, you know, in schools where we're kind of in a culture where everyone assumes everyone's going to do well, like everyone's gonna get an A, um, when they aren't getting necessarily the best grade or score, that can also be really jarring for people who then assume maybe they don't belong here. And for some students, that message of not being academically capable might compound with social interactions um, or other familial or financial realities. So are there ways, at least in the academic context, we might be able to intervene a bit and think about how do we create an opportunity to say, I, you actually can do this, and here are some structures and opportunities in place to help you do that. So I've done a ton of talking. I know we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I will, happy to answer things here now um, or via email. You can tweet at me. I'm not always a fast Twitter in responding, but I was, I'm happy to answer questions. What questions might you have? Um, I am wondering about group work as my first question. How do you, I feel that I experienced a microaggression just yesterday when trying to bring up um, black immigrants for intervention work and my colleague said like there's no research on it and I, in retrospect, wanted to say that's the whole point, <laughs> is that there's no, there's nothing and that's why. So, how do you facilitate that um, with your students? As yeah. So I see lots of different strategies. So some folks to avoid, so I, the path of least resistance is pick your part, pick who you like. But again, you get a lot of homophily, right? So the folks who tend to work in similar styles or care about the same stuff or have the similar identities 
that's how they clump themselves. Um, that sometimes it's helpful, but it doesn't always help. It doesn't ultimately, al you don't always get to pick who you get to work with. So I think because I'm in an applied field, like you don't get to pick your students. You don't get to pick who lives in the residence hall. You don't get to pick who you are academically advising. So sometimes we challenge students by placing them into groups. Um, I, I really do work with students to think about kind of these similar questions. Like what expectations do you need to set in your group around group work? Um, what does that look like, you know? And I don't think people are really good at doing that. They usually just say we're going to work in a group, but that means like 10 different things, right? So it can mean, and I think about this even writing papers collaboratively, right? It could mean that everyone's assigned their own thing and then we just plop it in. It could mean that we're actually going to talk through the ideas and then work separately and come together. It's going to mean that um, some, we're going to break out into sub-teams um, and talk through things. Uh, most of that, I, I would say even I as an instructor sometimes don't provide a clear enough expectation. But for me, I think what I've tried to do is say get in your groups and talk about how can you make this so it functions a, as best as it can for the group. And then honestly as the instructor, sometimes you do have to mediate or find a, a way to help students work through conflict. Um, I have mixed feelings, I think, about asking for feedback about people in the group, sometimes it's helpful, like, you know, did everybody do the work equally? And some groups, everyone will say yes, but in the background you've heard that one person has not been doing anything, but no one doesn't want to, no one wants to write it down. <laughs> so I, I think there, that's something that I struggle with, but it, I don't think we do enough of actually asking folks what does it mean to work in a group or team. Mm we just never figure it out. And I'm like, oh, that's like a life skill that many people are, we're constantly <laughs> negotiating and renegotiating. And I, I say that to students as well. Like, hey, I don't have all, again, sharing, learning, and being transparent. I do this imperfectly as well. And they're like, what? They think we just aren't telling them because we haven't figured out. Oh, no, no. Which I think is helpful for students to hear that we don't know everything. Like they, they know it sometimes, but sometimes we're viewed as experts in which that can't possibly be the case. Just to know. Yeah, um, and in that same vein, because I have observed it's more about the process with groups than the content. Mm -hmm. um, do you explicitly state in classes like we? Or like, is for you, is the process of the class, the course, the group, all as e equally as important as content mastery? Do you say that? I do. Okay. I, I say it straight up, but I teach at the graduate level, so I think there is something, you know, and if I'm teaching, so for example, it, in, in some classes, it makes more sense to students. So when I teach a class on equity, diversity, and inclusion, in student affairs practice where people are going to be sharing about their identities and grappling with privilege, I mean, that class, it seems to be very, yes, to them it makes sense. Mm -hmm. In a doc seminar, when I say that, they're like, what? Um, on org theory. And I said, but I still care about how we think about how we're engaging with the ideas, how we're going to give each other feedback. Um, how do I make this a good learning experience for everybody? And I think I've been startled that every time I ask doc students what would best help them learn, mm -hmm. outside of a diversity class, I would say most graduate students have never been asked what would help them learn. They just kind of stare for a minute and they go, seriously, like give some thought to it, we'll take some time, and I have to kind of like pull that out and then once I do, it's made it a lot easier for me as an instructor to problem solve, um, to really think about what am I not doing. And then honestly, it allows the students to say, hey, have you noticed that like, basically the same people are talking all the time? I've certainly noticed. Um, it allows them some freedom and flexibility to say here's what they start being more willing to contribute. Again, in a large-scale undergraduate class, you'd have to think differently about what that looks like. But I, but there are some opportunities. I, I just say it all the time, and I think it, once they see me ask questions and give examples, then they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's what this means. You're, you're not going to let it lie, essentially. 
I'd like to thank Dr. Paris for her presentation.